Hello and welcome to Rise of the Data Cloud. Today's episode features an interview with Ari Margalit, Global Vice President of Architecture and Data Solutions at Anheuser-Busch InBev. Ari was previously the CTO and Head of Solutions at Weisberger and Vice President of R&D and Israel Site Manager at Jive Software. On this episode, Ari talks about ABI leading the global beer industry in AI, the importance of being cloud agnostic, the negligible impact coronavirus has had on sales of Corona, one of the company's top brands, and much more. So please enjoy this conversation between Ari Margalit, Global Vice President of Architecture and Data Solutions at Anheuser-Busch InBev, and your host, Steve Hamm. Hey, Ari, good to meet you. And uh, I'm really intrigued to see that photograph behind you in, on the Zoom call. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It, it looks like a big brewery. Yes, I took that photo in uh, Ambev Brewery in Jagaruna. Yeah, one of our breweries in and Brazil. That's, that, that's in Brazil. Yes, yes. Okay. One okay. of our breweries in Brazil. Yeah. What impressed you so much about that brewery? First of all, if you go there, we did uh, some tour. If you go there, they have an, an amazing wall where you see the, the, the involvement of AB InBev. So mm. at the end, you see how this monster company was just started with uh, one, one, one brewery of uh, Brahma in Brazil. So you mm. see, I'm, uh-huh. so where, where I was, this used to be a brewery of, of Antarctica. It used to be Brahma's uh, like biggest competitor in uh, Brazil, and then they merged. So this is how this uh, great company started. And I went to that brewery. It was uh, super exciting to see, you know. And also you see there like how technology meet, you know, classical brewmastering. So it was pretty cool. You mentioned some of the subsidiary or, or, or previous companies to Anheuser-Busch InBev there. Maybe it would be good if we started off by you describing it. I mean, everybody knows you're you know, in the beer business, but if you could describe this sprawling global company with all these brands, I think that would be helpful to the, to the listener to understand uh, what, you know, the business and, and, and its, its various dimensions. So first of all, just to, to understand, AB InBev is, uh, is a very big company. It's a 180,000 employees company. I think uh, lately I saw the number of employees we have in Microsoft. I think it's smaller. So this, this is huge. And it's, it was made out of uh, M&As and many companies coming together. People that came from in investment uh, banking, just, you know, taking right decisions and, and buying companies. And, and at the end, it became a of Bush InBev. So uh, I think the journey started with Ambev that merged with InBev. So Ambev was a Brazilian big company. And they merged with a beer company from, from Belgium called Interbrewery. And then they joined together to become InBev. Uh, then they, saw, they bought um, Anheuser Bush, right? Which was the, the biggest American beer company. So Anheuser Bush with InBev became Anheuser Bush InBev. They also, along the way, bought a, a, a several other breweries, uh, including Modelo in Mexico. So this is a, a huge beer company, but that's, it's actually a, a joint family of, of breweries that came together. And that's it. Yeah, I think it would be helpful if you just list off the four or five or six most well-known brewery brands. Our three most known global brands are uh, Stella, Artois, uh, Budweiser, and uh, Corona, right? We all know those brands. I think uh, the next one in lines that are like globally uh, uh, known are uh, Laff and uh, Orgarden, which are like our Belgium brands and of course Michael of Ultra that is becoming very big in North America and Europe. So and, and we have many, right? That are more I would say more of a regional that are very known, like in South America you have the Brahma and the Skull, etc. I also have a sense that, you know, we had that huge phenomenon, the micro brewing phenomenon that came up over the last twenty or thirty years or so, which has really change the the landscape for brewing my my sense is that your company has kind of you know both does these big broad you know crowd pleasing brands but also has some micro breweries and things like that within it correct yeah we've got goose island for example which i love that beer right mm-hmm. a very a strong one actually i think uh 
our garden started like that. So we have our own like homegrown craft beer or we have our the, the ones that we were uh, buying in the last few years. There is the uh, part of our company called ZX Ventures that are buying craft beer and, and joining them and, and, and maturing them. And once they become like more than X, you know, in revenue, then they, they turn yeah. them into a global brands. Now, you've been there for about a year. Yeah. And previously, I know you were at uh, Weisberger, and that is a data analytics software company focusing on the beer industry. So what are the particular challenges and opportunities in the beer industry that can be addressed by data analytics? Uh, that, that is a great question. So as I told you, ABI is a Fortune 500 company, uh, world-leading CPG, accountable for 40% of the beer consumption, and 400 brands of beer. Right, and they're going through a transformation. I think that uh, many CPGs companies and low low tech companies, you can see it happening with McDonald's. We can see it happening with um, Domino's Pizza, etc. They're fighting uh, the fight of like digital transformation. The beer category, I think, uh, in the West world, is going through a tough time, like fighting with uh, liquors and and you know, other spirits. And at the end, the company needs to show a growth in bottom line, a growth in the beer category, and it's tough. So we are in years in which we're trying to transform ourselves, right, to become more digital. We think that will bring us that growth. So, and when we, when you want to to become more digital, the growth has a link uh, to what you do with data. So data is is as a decision making infra, or I would say data as the base for decision-making gets more weight. And with the with addition on top of that, I would say AI and ML, right? AI for uh, mm-hmm. artificial intelligence and ML for uh, machine learning is becoming uh, a, a, a big thing. So ABI wants to become number one in leading those, this technical transformation, becoming the number one CPG digital, digital company and a leader and a shaper. So bringing advanced mm-hmm. analytics on top of data as a core capability, uh, uh, it is becoming very big. And we started to adapt best practices in that field, I think, a couple of years ago. And now in the last year, it's been accelerated dramatically since I joined. Uh, as Data is now treated as a corporate asset. We have so much of it, you know, we had to put uh, really like a structure in it. We had to bring it in different ways to different personas from hundreds of data sources for uh, the story I told you about how this company was yeah. created. We had to create our global master data, which was like a mess with like many companies coming uh, together. And most important, create this like what, what I call full feedback loop of data between all business function of the company and then unleash the, the yeah. power of AI. So all of that was was uh, based on top of a global data platform product that, that when it, since I joined, we initiated it. And I lead. It's called Brudat. You will hear me talking about Brudat a lot. And we have AI labs, best R and D, test and learn, new algorithms approaches in the company, like appearing everywhere. And and we're trying to bring all of them on top of Brudat. So this is what I'm trying to do. We adjusted our operation model to to be more and more driven by AI. We started to work with predictive models to forecast the future. And we created a huge, huge distributed multi-country data and analytics talent and culture. So pretty exciting times. And today we realize really, we start to realize the full value of, you know, what it means to have a global data platform, what it means to, to run AI yeah. and run business with AI. So a long, a long yeah. answer, yeah. but I tried to... No. <laughs> That's a great answer. Now, you've been Global Vice President for Architecture and Data Solutions for about a year. You made a, a quick reference to that. Was that brew that was that was that platform what you were brought in to do, or is that what you decided to do when you were brought in? So, first of all, I'm not new to ABI. So, ABI bought uh, a company that I was uh, a CTO of, right? You mentioned it at the beginning, Weisberger. So, yeah. Okay. So, I was Weisberger CTO, and once they bought us, uh, they acquired us at uh, January uh, 2018. So I've been, uh, and before that, they were our customers. So I met them as our customer, and then I've been working as under Weisberger. So they knew me, right? And uh, when they brought me, they brought me to help them uh, transform 
a solution organization, a global solution organization into a technology organization and bring fresh blood of technology leaders that work in technology companies all their career, right? I'm not the only one that was brought, by the way. And we were bringing more tech talents with us, right? Helping to increase our talent pool. And, and when I joined, I, I was tasked with some global responsibilities in, in that technology organization uh, that included data, integration, API, microservices transformation, and overall to look over our global architecture. But very fast, me and my team, we understood that the biggest and most important challenge uh, we're going to focus on was data. Right, And my organization today is putting 80%, maybe 90% of our efforts and mind into building Brudat. So th- that was like really fast. We evolved ourselves to, to bring this uh, new brand, a new, new idea. Yeah. And, and it's already becoming number one technology backbone of our company really fast. COVID really helped. And that would be the base platform that on top all our main global products will be built or transformed to be built on. And the different functions in the company, uh, company have, uh, they, they all have solution groups. As I said, very big company, very, very complex structure. But at the end, there is like a function and every function has a solution group. And that solution group, as we are evolving, we're evolving to build in-house development, in-house products. And what me and my team are trying to do is bring all those products portfolios on top of Brudat. So that would be like the one backbone of technology for everything we're building. So it's becoming yeah. very big. Yeah. It sounds like you you really are moving very fast. I want to just make sure I understand totally here. When you talked about Brudet, what exactly, what data are you collecting there and how is that data being used? Is that a data lake or something or what, what, what is that? Brudet, first of all, is a platform. It's much more than a data lake. It's an ecosystem. I'll give you an example. Let's take Uber. So Uber, you have the drivers, you have the, and you have the customer that we go and we need uh, a ride, right? So at the end, what is Uber? They, they're not the drivers, they're not the cars, they're, they're not the users. So what are they? So they are the platform, right? They enable that ecosystem. Same goes for Brudat. We are an ecosystem for data. We enable data producers and consumer among all the company users, right? Uh, for me, all the 180,000 employees can be that customer. But at the end, I, I believe it's more the, the technic- technical users. We enable them to create the business value out of data. And because the, the company is so complex and so much sources, as, as I said, of data, and it's so not structured, you need to build a platform to bring everything together and then to service that data to people per their needs. So there are like five different, maybe six different personas in a company that need data. It could be a business analyst. It could be a data scientist. It could be a business um, decision maker. It could be a, a BI. It could be a developer. They all need data. And you need to serve it in a simple way, in an accessible way, but in different ways. So we, we built that yeah. platform with couple of layers as an envelope to enable people to reach their data. So it's much more than the data lake, right? The data lake is the lower piece. You need also API layer. You need microservices layer. You need GUI for right. self-service. You need uh, master data management. You need governance. You name it. It's very complex. And, and what have we found in the process is that you cannot go and buy data off the shelf. And it's very related to what the business you support. So we had to build our own in-house IP, you know, proprietary platform to support that need in our company. Yeah, well, let me ask you about that. I mean, people talk about alternative data, and this is like data that, you know, doesn't come from your own operations or, you know, but really gives a a broader contextual view. It might even bring in, you know, weather, you know, geopolitics, all all kinds of, you know, healthcare. How are you bringing that into uh, Brudet? So it's interesting uh, what you're saying. So first of all, you need the data that you bring. It has a couple of layers. First, we need to have the transactional level data. So you want to have, you know, what's happening out there. So we bring our own transactions, right? We sell beer. So we have transaction of selling. We bring our financial transaction. We bring everything. We bring our people transaction, whatever is in our system, our logistics, our supply, our marketing. We have so many functions. They all generate transaction. 
So we bring those in, right? right. We also want to buy transaction that makes sense. So for example, very important transaction is what are our customer, right? Our customers are the point of consumption. It's a beer. Uh, it could be a, a, a restaurant. It could be a bar. It could be a, a supermarket, right? There are many types of res- mm-hmm. customers. They also sell out, right? They also sell our products. So those transactions do not exist in our system. They exist in the point of sale. So there it's a bit more complex. So we have two types of ways to bring it because we want it in the transactional level. So or we can go and buy it from a point of sale vendor or we can bring it from products that integrate with the point of sale vendor. So for example, in Weisberger, we were integrating inside the bar, we're bringing our own sensors, but we're also integrating with the point of sale. We bring that transactional level data and then we start to put algorithms in, and understand like what this data brings. And in the big data world, it brings a lot. So this is something we, or again, integ- integrate or we buy. So that's the second type. Mm. And then comes like okay. the metadata, the, the data that you need to bring from the side uh, to enrich the data, or it's our metadata, our employees' data, our customer data, our, our brand's data, our SKU, or I need to go bring, bring it from our side. And the last piece right. is what you just mentioned. It's the enrichment of the data. So I want to go and buy or bring from open space, right? There are out there in the open um, data that you that is available. You don't need to buy. For example, you can get weather data. You can get events data. In the COVID-19 period, we, we went and found like data around demographic data, data about uh, when governance took decision on restrictions. We brought that data and so on and so forth. And what you see when you bring everything, everything together, only then you unleash a, the real AI. Because then you start to understand, like the butterfly effect, you start to understand what is the effect of all this data together on, on decision making and also the, on the inside. And from that, you can bring the real like recommendation to the business, you can real to your consumers, and then you unleash, you know, things that you cannot really understand before. You know, during COVID, my beer buying Habits have changed. Yeah, how come? Well, I walked onto my local brewery. I call them up, tell them what I want, and they bring a six pack of beer out to a little table in front of wow. in front of the place. That's cool. Yeah, it's not. I wouldn't call that a high volume business, but at least you know it's a way to keep the connection going. You yeah, know? I think COVID changed the way we consume. It accelerated the, the whole like e commerce remote. We were a business that we're still like classical business. We had a lot of like sales reps out there and now it's, we're turning ourselves so much faster to be a digital company. Everything is like online, B2B, B2B2C. It's, it's growing dramatically and I see it everywhere, right? So it changed the way we consume. Yeah, yeah. So when did your company and Snowflake basically start doing things together? Are you a customer of theirs in, in, a, in a big way or a small way or what? We started talking with Snowflake at uh, age two, two, 2019, so not long ago. Mm. I started, I think, most of the conversations. And we had a few months of like dating, okay, as you might say. We ran a few successful POCs. I, I know there were a couple of POCs before I even joined, and, but I, nothing went into a real contract. And then I, I became like a sponsor. I do believe in that solution as much as I saw it. And then we started to test POCs on top of uh, our two main cloud solution. Our, our number one main cloud solution is Azure. And then the second one, I think, is AWS. So we started to test a couple of POCs on both. And the idea was simple. We were looking for cloud agnostic solutions. So to become cloud agnostic in our data warehousing, which Snowflake was for that, right? We're bringing that, sorry. Performance, we, we wanted to find the best technology and solution out there to run at scale with data. Right, and we saw that as we were scanning up with with the the, the different uh, solution out there from Azure and, and AWS, it was uh, it's, it's were becoming like a, a tough mission. It's not that it was impossible, but it became very costly, and we also saw some performance uh, challenges. So that was the second reason we were looking at the Snowflake, and the third was cost. We we thought that we can reduce actually the cost of our AWS Redshift our Azure uh, SQL DW, and when we did POCs, it it was showing that exactly. So uh, again, those are the three main reasons, Uh, and we signed uh, the final global deal uh, during COVID-19 crisis, actually around, uh, I think, March, April, so a global deal 
and that's it. That, this is for your point number one. And then asking yeah, yeah. Uh, the, about the project, we had like uh, six initiatives. Three, there are ongoing projects already signed SOW, and three. So are these are these the p- proof of concepts, or are the the are these part of the global deal? These. No, say? no, we had the global deal, and then we had like a specific deals per per project. We had six projects that we oh, would see. look at. Three of those ended up with a, like a project that is live, and we're working on together. Mm-hmm. I can and ex- explain if you want. And then there are additional three that I see them as more of a prospect and hopefully become a project next year. Describe one of them that you're, that you're entering into now that's, that's real and kind of like, what's the problem? How does this solve it? What, what benefits does it bring? And then we can talk okay. maybe okay. about something you're looking forward to. I think the biggest is a big, a huge transformation. Uh, a step back, uh, ABI is built out of six zones. So uh, each zone is a, actually a continent. So I w- if I will use the word zones, just for you to understand. So NAS is our North America zone. So it's the America North, uh, us- mainly US and, and Canada. We don't have Middle America there. And in US, we had uh, a Teradata environment on a data center, which is what was a big pain because we really want to move out of it to the cloud. And, and, and NAS is our biggest zone in terms of consumption and revenue. And, and we were looking at a project when I joined, we were looking at a project of one year, many question marks to transform it to the cloud, move it to Azure. We brought a couple of third-party companies. It was looking very expensive. A lot of like things that were unknown. The people were a bit, you know, uh, scared to to step in into that project. We were talking about it thirty years there, data amount of data, and I and I offered to bring Snowflake. To, to that point, it was uh, an idea that came from me and, and I pushed the team and Slowflake came in big and really offered that help because it's not a, I would say a typical, let's move to the cloud or a small company moving to the cloud was a big deal. And Snowflake stepped in and we, we, we joined forces and we're now in, in, in the middle of the progress, a couple of months already of that project. It's, it's, it's a signed project, right? And the idea is to move all the Teradata data to map everything and then the important data, everything to migrate to, to Snowflake into the cloud. And again, it's 1% Snowflake. We're looking at a six months project instead of a one year. We're looking at a project that was mapped completely with Snowflake, you know, moving all the data with, with Snowflake uh, team and experts. So it looks really promising. There is a great progress going on. So I'm pretty happy. What kind of benefits are you expecting out of that? First, I want to have as much as I can our solution to become, as we evolve, a cloud agnostic solution. So Snowflake is going to help with that, right? So I can have one zone in a data warehouse in the cloud in Snowflake and it's agnostic. So that's great for us. This is one. And as we evolve, I want to become more and more agnostic. So the advantage of being cloud agnostic is that you're not overly dependent on any one cloud provider. Exactly. You, they don't have that leverage on you. You you're you're free. On, only in this part, right? I'm not free really because we are we are <laughs> so deep into the cloud and have such a big deal yeah. going on with with both the the big companies I mentioned. Yeah. But at least part of it we want to be free. And not just to, for, mm-hmm. for uh, it's great to be free, right? But it's not just because of that. Yeah. It's because then we can always choose the best technology. We can connect between our different, we have data in both the clouds, so I can connect them through Snowflake. So this is second. And, and also, to be honest, when we were using Snowflake, we were seeing, I think, it, and, and don't get me by the number, but when we tested it versus uh, Brudat, that uh, we did a POC with Brudat and we tried versus Azure uh, SQL the database, the, the, the data warehouse, and we saw that we have something tw- like 20% improvement in performance, which is very big for us. Mm-hmm. And when we tested it uh, in Weisberger for our uh, Redshift data warehouse uh, with AWS, we saw that it's bringing something like 40%, again, from what we saw. So that is a big thing. It's more if, even bigger than the, the agnostic thing, like it, to, to improve performance in a big data environment when the world is changing to become much more real-time, much more close. You know, you need to bring the data fast. This is, this is big for us. Yeah. Now, I want to drill down on this just a little more <laughs> before we move on to the, to the future project. But so 
What does Snowflake's cloud data platform allow you to do that you could not do or do as well on Teradata and your own, you know, your own data centers and, and all that? For me, it's cloud agnostic. Two, step, uh, step in really big here, helping us do a transformation from a, a, an old data center when we had almost zero knowledge already in home for the old ETLs that we, we built. And they helped us, you know, put the experts and re rebuild those ETLs, transform them into the Snowflake language or Snowflake format. Mm-hmm. So that was a huge help. They help us make it faster. So it's the, it's 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 time to to market and it's it's saving money, right? If you do things faster. So yeah. I think and and add to that what I just mentioned around the uh, um, uh, performance and cost of running the day to day data warehouse. I think it's big. You mentioned you have this huge supply chain. You have a huge distribution chain. You talked about needing to get data from both directions. Hey, are you looking at the um, Snowflake data exchange as something you're going to be using for those things? First of all, just to mention, we don't have just uh, supply logistics. We also have a huge business of sales with digital products. Yeah. We have a huge business of finance. Like We have more than that, so many functions. Uh, yeah, we're looking at that. We, we, we didn't get yet to, to use it. I think uh, if you will ask me about the future project, Maybe that, that yeah. would be an opportunity to look at that. <laughs> well, what about that future project? <laughs> Unfortunately, in 2020, we were trying to bring a, a, a very important project to life, which is uh, bringing Snowflake in Brudat, right? Our global data platform, our biggest data piece of the pie. And we we're very close to do that. And unfortunately, as I said, due to COVID, we had some, I would say, restrictions on our budget and on our new investments. So I had to put it on hold until 2021. So right now, Brudat, uh, the global f- uh, platform is not yet using f- um, Snowflake. And as I'm a, a big Snowflake fan, I hope we'll find ourselves uh, in 2021 exploring that again and, and going into a project that we can move our data we are seeing of the global data platform uh, to Snowflake. If, if that will happen, that will be not just a, a very important step for us, but also I think a very important project for for Snowflake. So you're using Snowflake in a more limited way now. And is that with the North America? And and then you're in the future you're planning on just going global with it. Is that am I am I understanding correctly? You understand correct, but there are more. There's even yeah, more. We're using uh, Snowflake uh, in our ZX venture, which I mentioned that is yeah. uh, like we have our family of companies under ABI. So ZX is, is a business unit that runs on its own, does e-commerce, that does ventures, uh, capital, and also have like set of most of our craft beers and, and some, some of our own retail. So they have uh, a lot of data and analytics and they're moving their data and analytics to Snowflake. So this is one. Two is Weisberger that we were looking at moving and we, we put it on the shelf. We're going to bring it back in 2021. We have Bees. Bees is our biggest portfolio of products in the company, is our digital sales uh, in, in, initiative, a huge initiative by the company that was even accelerated in the COVID, right? Including what we call B2B Delta, which is our new B2B business to, you know, to, to sell through an application that has a strong algorithm selling and, and, and all kind of like cool analytics built in inside that are being built on top of Brudat. And they have a piece that is uh, capturing the behavior of our consumers. And all the behavior of our analytics of our consumer is going into Snowflake now. So this is a new project that, mm. that is signed and, and started. And in addition to all I just mentioned, there is also our MAS uh, zone, which is our middle America. Yeah. That is also the last zone that is still in a data center, a big zone in a data center that we were talking with Snowflake and with them to bring them into Snowflake. And it, it really got on hold. And I think in 2021, we're going to explore it again. If NAS project will be successful, I do believe it's going to be a huge project for Snowflake. So a lot of opportunities, a lot of prospects happening here. So uh, cross fingers. You know, we, you've made a couple references to, you know, kind of the, the macro or the, the you know the, the global market conditions you know some challenges in sales and beer 
obviously COVID, like a lot of other companies of all different sizes, it's under stress. How are you using analytics to get through this very stressful period? I think a reference uh, a bit to, uh, uh, to that, we're trying to, un- to use analytics to drive decision-making, right? I, I mentioned that. Mm-hmm. So think about yes. that. We had the COVID, for example. Let's take it as, as an example. And everybody was stressed. The, the management, nobody knew what's going to happen, right? It was a tough time for, for companies that are, that are uh, manufacturing beer because, for example, our Mexico Modelo plants were being shut down by the governance from good reasons because they didn't want uh, people to spend their money on alcohol in such times. We had a lot of quarantine countries. We, we were having a tough time, right? So we, want, we were trying to help our decision makers to take the right decision and without analytics, they were in the dark. So what we did, we took brought that data, we bought our talented pool of like analytics data science that we, we've built through the years, and they're analyzing all the data we had, plus bringing in the, the enrichment of data that I mentioned, like you know the epidemic data, the governance decision data, and we were putting everything into the the graphs and running the models, and we were trying to predict what is the you know pessimistic and what is the optimistic prediction of our future and then we took decision how much we need to cut where where do we need to focus yeah. what, what is the hit list of customers we need to go and, and and send our people to how we need to change the way we work in order to go through this crisis without really knowing what will happen so without analytics we will be in the dark and now we brought them that light we were coming with the analytics graphs making them more and more relevant than ever to our senior leadership and, and giving them, you know, the eyes uh, and ears they needed to take decision. And actually, we were helping the company in, 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 in ways that we never did. And it was amazing. If we didn't build all this infrastructure yeah. through the last few years, we could not do it. So that was amazing. So I, I would imagine that AI and specifically machine learning are extremely useful in helping deal with complexity and uncertainty, which is what everybody faces these days. Are, are you bringing AI to bear on this stuff? Yeah, yeah, it's all AI and, and ML. So mm-hmm. the analytics, what I mentioned before, for example, is a building prediction model using AI, right? Yeah. Uh, you take data yeah, right. from historical data, right? And, and you take also ongoing uh, data that is happening right uh, out there for, for things that are happening out there, events, as I said, epidemic uh, data, uh, demographic data, consumer data, like what people are consuming, the behavior. You bring all of that plus the history and you try to predict. So you use AI to predict. The machine learning yes. is another step, right? You can predict, but you need to accu- you make yourself more accurate. So by bringing a, a feedback to the system using machine learning, you can ac- make yourself more accurate because the one thing that happened with COVID we actually thought things would be worse. So when, when everything mm. happened with Italy, Italy right, and, and, and everybody got scared of what happened in Italy, and, and people got really pessimistic. So we gave the pessimistic model and we gave the optimistic model, and we had to adjust it every week. So without machine learning, we could not adjust. So we brought the feedback, and we started to adjust with machine learning, and, the, and we became more and more accurate. And right now it became like... What we did in the last three months, the level of accuracy we brought with machine learning, our decision-making is only on top of that, and it became a reference. Right. So this is pretty cool. Now, in, with, with COVID, you have a misfortune, which is that one of your big brands has the same name as the virus. Oh, my God. Yeah. How have you, how have you dealt with that? And, and has, has, artificial, I mean, has AI or, or analytics kind of played into that? Are you, I mean, are you doing different things in marketing or uh, or listening? Or to be what? honest, it didn't affect us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? Because first of all, people start to say Corona, but then it became like COVID. It helped us. They start yeah. to use the right name, but it didn't affect us. That's right. They, they, went, they went from the... They went from the disease, the virus, to the name of the disease, exactly. and that was a good transition. Yeah, for it you. was good yeah. for us. But but anyway, it didn't affect. Many people ask us, it didn't affect the the brand, and and actually we start to think that it will create a positive effect once hopefully everything you know we will get rid of this horrible disease. We think it will. Yeah. We can turn it into a positive effect one day, but only time will tell. 
You know, I noticed that earlier in your career, you worked at a little company called Jive Software, which is very kind of social business conscious. Yeah. And here we, here we are in the COVID crisis, and there are a lot of people kind of talking about pivots, about society, the economy. Are there things that we need to adjust? Not just in companies, big companies like ABI, but, you know, in the way we operate as, as you know, homo sapiens and all that kind of stuff. You're obviously a very sharp technical guy, and, and you think about business a lot. Are you thinking about, you know, transformation in society and how technology can help that? So super interesting question. Listen, first of all, the amount of data that was generated in the world in the last three years is bigger than what we have gathered in the history of mankind. Just for you to know. Yeah. We're in the middle of like an analytics analytics transformation of the world, right? In every field. Everybody feels that. And that was expedited with the COVID-19 crisis. So seeing the whole world, you know, moving to work remote seeing the health industry changing and expediting to become a remote led, right? Something that I think it expedited in 10, 15 years yeah. during the COVID. Uh, and everything is led by data. Think about it. And, and AI, yeah. data is the infra and the oil. And AI is the platform. AI is the way we right. turn it. So, so I'm seeing governance, as I said, taking decision with AI prediction. Right, uh, I don't think it happened in the past uh, uh, with with AI model. I see companies making decision, as I said about us, in their future on forecasting using AI. I see our prime minister of Israel, Bibi. He came live live on TV several times uh, during the COVID, and he shows analytic reports that people made for him using analytics. Right uh, during the COVID, yes. so it never happened before. So. Of course, the world is changing. I think it's changing for the good in that sense. I believe in every topic, we're going to have AIs in every stream of our life. We start. We will start to evolve. We're going to have IoT sensor, Internet of Things sensors that transfer live data uh, and, and, and AI models being built on top of that, that data that is being brought to such data platforms. So I will give you examples. Today, everybody has the, 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 the smartwatch, right? And it collects only your what? It collects your heart rate and, 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 and maybe calories and steps and things like that. This is going to be evolved fast to, to, to gather all the data from your body. And then it will be sent to your doctor and you'll be able to give life decision. And you won't have to go to the doctor. We will be able to prevent diseases like that. We will be able to, to, to detect and advance problems, right? We'll be able to detect problems with our children. So I think in some sense, the world is, is going to be a better place to live in. In some sense, it's a, yeah. it's a bit scary. You know, one other thing I wanted to mention you is in another project I'm working on, we're working with Spark Beyond out of Tel Aviv. Ah, Do you know those guys? Of course. They're amazing. Amazing yeah. product. Yeah. Yeah. I just think the whole idea of having these hypothesis generating or ideation AI machines and, and, and bringing together, you know, the, the human experts and these machines and just pack, you know, packing a bunch of data into them and having a collaboration between the humans and the machines, I think is really very powerful. So I agree completely in Spark and Beyond our, our partners. Yeah. We work with them uh, with our AI labs and I also know them very well because, of course, they are Israelis and it's a small like, community. Yeah. But they're, they're yeah, doing great. It's a wonderful company. Well, Ari, it's so good to talk to you today. This has been a really lively and fun conversation. And, and uh, I feel like I've learned a lot. I feel like the people who tune into the podcast are going to have their eyes open a bit as well. And it's also very refreshing to talk to somebody like you who has, you know, you really have that hardcore technology look, that, that urgency, you're really focused on the business, but you also have a broader view about society and the economy and things like that. So that's, thank you. That's thank very you. Appreciate encouraging that. to me. Appreciate that. Thank you yeah. very much. It was a, a pleasure for me to talk with you and I, I hope we will have a better future for all mankind with, with everything that yeah. is happening, right? Uh, so... Cross fingers. Let's hope so. That does it for this episode of Rise of the Data Cloud. Thank you for listening. This episode is brought to you by Snowflake. To see how you can get secure and easy access to any data with near infinite scalability, visit snowflake.com.